Hello, everybody. This is Tim Ash, the CEO of Site Tuners, and I am very happy to conduct another one of our monthly free webinars. Uh, today, my guest is Brian Massey, the conversion scientist. I'll tell you a little bit more about Brian in a minute, but uh, uh, there are always some logistical questions. I want to get those out of the way. The slides from this presentation, as well as a video recording, will be available afterwards. Uh, we'll send you a follow-up email with those details. Uh, so just you know, listen in and soak it in. No need to take notes. You'll you'll have it to refer to again. Uh, we're going to have a live Q and A with Brian at the at the end of the of the webinar, the last few minutes. So uh, please, you're going to have a, a question pane in your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, as we go along, if you have any questions for Brian or for me, uh, we'll we'll field those at the end. Okay, and uh, with that. We're going to get started. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Site Tuners and Brian, and then at the end we'll, we'll have a couple of special offers for you as well. Uh, Site Tuners, as you probably know by now, is a, a digital agency focused on one thing, conversion rate optimization. The only thing we want to do is influence your visitors to take the desired action once they get to your website or your landing page. And we work across all industries, all over the world with all company sizes. So I think you probably recognize some of these names, so enough of that. Uh, we have three main practice areas. Uh, we can help you design your website for higher conversion, not for pretty pictures or sliders or parallax background videos, but for higher conversion. Uh, we can also, of course, help you with AB and multivariate test plan development and test strategy development. And finally, we work with clients on an ongoing basis uh, in our conversion management practice to improve their own self-sufficiency uh, and ride the what we call the conversion maturity model to higher maturity levels. In other words, become a more agile conversion optimization company with that in its very core. Uh, today's guest is my, my good friend, Brian Massey. Brian has spoken uh, at many, many conversion-related conferences uh, here and in, in Europe as well. He's known as the conversion scientist. If you've seen a guy in a white lab coat, it was probably Brian. Um, and he's also a master doodler who can doodle during sessions in real time. It's actually pretty amazing. But uh, he's here to dish to you guys his knowledge of conversion copywriting. So without further ado, Brian, uh, welcome to the program and take it away. All right. I am absolutely delighted to be here. I love, Tim, what you and Site Tuners is doing for the industry because still we are still in this process of educating the world on what we're about. I mean, the, the disciplines of conversion have been necessary from the times of the first websites, way back about the same time that Stonehenge was built, I think. Um, so it's always been important, but the set of practices that we call conversion optimization or website optimization uh, is still feels like a new industry. So uh, I love an opportunity to chat with you guys and talk about what we're learning because um, we're all data driven. And so we are actually taking the assumptions of the past, the assumptions that you get from Madison Avenue type marketing and applying data, doing studies and tests to find out are these assumptions right. And what we're learning uh, is often baffling, as I will explain here in short order. Before I get started, I want to talk about a company called Beta Brand. So Beta Brand is a, a business that started with one product. And the premise of this product was that people would buy corduroy pants in which the whales went sideways or around and around rather than up and down like traditional corduroy pants. And You can see in this picture an idea of what this looks like. Pretty stylish. Is this something that you could really build a business on? Could you build a business on an alternative corduroy pants style? Well, here's what they did. Here's how they describe these. Friction-free, unlike vertical corduroy, which produces friction that can heat your crotch to uncomfortable, potentially catastrophic levels, quarter rounds, horizontal whales mesh evenly, lowering the average wearer's crotch heat index, the CHI, by up to 22%. Now, of course, this is 
total bull. There really is no uh, measurement of the CHI, but it is interesting reading. And they go as far as to do diagrams and put uh, um, some equations together around this. And what are they doing here? Well, they're attaching, using copy, they're attaching an experience to a product that otherwise might be unremarkable. And their CEO said, if you create something with a hook, you can experience dramatic results. So what kind of dramatic results are we talking about here? Well, over their first three years in business, they started in 2009, uh, they grew 432%. One of their additional products is the bike to work pants in which you can actually pull out the pockets and reflectors appear and it's got a special snap or that allows you to roll up your pants. So the bike to work pants has 220,000 backlinks. At least it did last year when I originally did this research. Their email newsletter has a 40 to 45 percent open rate. And get this, they get 25 customer photos on day, a day on average of people taking a picture of themselves wearing the products. So they have clearly created something with their copy far and above the value proposition of the products. Just to give you an idea of some of the other things they have, they have a pinstriped hoodie, uh, and uh, they have dress pants, sweatpants, so sweatpants that look like dress pants, just to give you an idea of the quirky products that they're pulling together. They really have created something, and I would argue it's because of the copy they put together. I'm going to discuss with you today some of the things that are in the way of our copy and why a company like Beta Brand can um, have such explosive growth with products that are otherwise um, mundane or uh, unimportant. A little bit about me, I think Tim uh, summarized what we do. Conversion is, conversion sciences is, uh, I founded conversion sciences is what I'm trying to say and I'm a, a computer scientist by training. I went and did technical sales at uh, Texas Instruments, a semiconductor company. Um, started my own company, ran it in the 90s. I was a corporate marketer through the 2000s after the uh, dot-com crash. So when you pull all this together and mash it together, there's really nothing else you could be than a conversion scientist, and I fit very naturally in it. We started Conversion Sciences in 2007. Conversion Sciences, like, like Tim's organization, is all about optimization. We don't do anything else. Um, I think the difference between us is that we are a complete turnkey solution for a testing process. So we're going to actually have some people in lab coats parachute in and, actually, and do the testing and experimenting on your site to find more leads and more sales. Um, you should check out my book on Amazon, Your Customer Creation Equation. Uh, and if you could see me, you would see how fabulous I look in a web coat because a lab coat because yes, I am wearing one as we speak. So we started to get an understanding that there was something strange going on with the way copy works in the human mind when we looked at the real scientific method. And the scientific method, when you get into experimenting, is going to look something like this. You start doing research on a hypothesis or something you want to do. You start doing research and understanding the data, for instance, around your um, website, looking at the analytics looking at uh, re uh, session recordings, doing user testing, whatever you want to do to begin to understand what might be causing a problem. You generate a hypothesis. You might say, if we change this on our site, things would go better. In the context of this presentation, you might say, what if we led, led with a different headline on our landing page? That might increase our conversion rate. You design an experiment, so you want to make sure that you've got a, a control, that you're, whatever additional headlines you're your uh, testing get the same amount of traffic and that you could achieve a statistically significant sample size before you make a decision. You run the test and then you tabulate the results and inevitably you, you're going to be surprised by what you find and we call this actually the WTF cycle because the things that will work for the audience oftentimes will be counter to what your intuition is. The things that make someone comfortable, feel comfortable taking action, that make someone feel confident in buying from you will surprise you. So when I'm talking here about copy, let's, let's do a little definition. What is copy? 
we see copy as words, of course, but we also see copy as the typography, the punctuation, and the images that accompany a value proposition. When you're talking about a persuasive web page, you really are talking about communicating and supporting a value proposition, at the end of which is going to be an opportunity for the visitor to take action. And I see it as it is an opportunity because if you do a good job of delivering your value proposition and defining what's awesome about your offering, uh, it is just cruel not to have a clear way for someone to take action. They say, yes, this sounds great for me, and then they have to hunt and peck or um, sur surf around your website to find out how they actually partake, how do they get the, the piece of information, how do they buy the product. So all of these things have to play uh, a role, and we even believe that motion images or video is a part of copy. It's a very uh, in, uh, rich way of delivering a value proposition, and it is also a very uh, powerful way of shooting yourself in the foot because video done wrong can significantly reduce your results. So in thinking about beta brand, why did they have to go to all this trouble to talk about the, the crotch heat index? Why do they have to take their copy to this level? Why do they have to create the hooks? Why can't we just put the facts out there and communicate in a very understandable and succinct way and let the visitor make a choice based on the facts? Well, it turns out there's a couple bastards in our brains. I'm going to introduce you to these guys, and their job is to filter out the typical. We'll talk about that. Let's start off talking uh, about who they are. I'm first going to introduce you to Pierre Paul Broca. He discovered a part of the brain that is, if you raise your hand in the air and you bend at the elbow in your left hand, bend at the elbow and point just in front of your ear, you're pointing at Broca's area, which he discovered. It's in the triangular portion of the inferior frontal gyrus, for those of you that are keeping track. This is the part of the brain that um, is responsible for taking words, translating them into the um, into the, uh, the meaning that they have, these verbs, and then casting them onto what is called the visual spatial sketch pad that is in our brain. So Broca's area is responsible for drawing the pictures of us in the future, using the product, getting what you're offering, that sort of thing. If you were to raise your left hand in the air again and bend at the elbow and place your finger just behind your left ear, you would be pointing at Carl at Wernicke's area, discovered by Carl Wernicke. Now, in the West, we call him Wernicke, so uh, it is a German name, and um, I wanted to make sure that I pronounced that right when I was speaking in Germany. So, Wernicke or Wernicke. Now, the Wernicke's area is located in the superior tempo, temporal gyrus, and it is over there close to that inferior uh, pari parietal lobule. And what this means is that Wernicke's area has access to our memories. So its primary job is to take nouns and create and, and attach them to the memories of what that noun means. When we say car, it's Wernicke's area that brings the images that we have of cars and the experiences that we have of cars um, to mind so that we know what that word car means when we're reading or hearing it. These two guys work together using uh, what is what is called the arcuate fascicula. This is a high-speed network of nerves that connect these guys, so they're working together. But they're not just decoding words. These guys are um, applying meaning, and you can kind of see in the terms of how they work together how that works. Let's take an example. This is a brain scan in which someone is looking at a, a page that has words on it, but not reading the words. What you're seeing here is the back of the brain lit up like a Christmas tree. This is where the visual cortex is. And the visual cortex job is to process images. Images come from our eyes, they cross in the middle, they go back to the back of the head, and then the visual cortex assigns certain parts of the brain to deciphering them. There's parts of the brain that, that understands and recognizes faces. There's parts of the brain that understands angles and edges. There's parts of the brain that decipher motion and things like that. So um, this is when we're just looking at words. But when we're reading or speaking words, 
reading or generating words, we see something very different. These two areas, Broca's area and Wernicke's area, light up. And you can see them very clearly here in this brain scan. So something very different is going on when we're communicating. This is what, this is what we want. We want people thinking about our messages so that they're persuaded to take action. Uh, of importance here is the uh, motor cortex. So we talked about the visual spatial sketch pad. And the motor cortex is where actions get turned into motion. Uh, Bro Broca's area really stands as a guard to the motor cortex. We don't want messages coming into our brains and then having that influence automatically make us do something. If I was uh, sitting here and I said, pick your nose while you're in the middle of an important meeting, we want something filtering that action. And that really is what Broca's area is designed to do. So we've got to get past Broca before we're going to get any action taken for two reasons. Number one, we won't take an action until we imagine ourselves taking that action. And that is the job of the, the visual spatial sketch pad. Broca's area controls that, and therefore Broca's area controls whether or not that image of us taking action uh, in, in, on our pages or in our spoken words, if, uh, it's limiting that for us. So we want to make sure that we uh, are paying attention to Broca's area. And Wernicke's area um, is the source of all of the information that we need to associate these words with past memories. So our job is to get past Broca to wake up Wernicke and to get our action, our value proposition, cast upon the visual spatial sketch pad and then passed on to the motor cortex where we take action. This obviously is quite simplified, but this is, if you, um, if you are conscious of each of these steps, your copy is going to improve markedly. And I just love this picture, so I had to use it. This is essentially Broca's area, standing at guard to the motor cortex, standing in the background. Let's talk about what it takes to surprise Broca. So Broca's area, we think, evolved so that we would be able to limit the, the processing required for uh, certain situations. If everything got processed equally in our brains, we wouldn't have the energy, we wouldn't have the capacity to handle them all. So we need to be able to distinguish between the sound of grass blowing. If you could imagine us as we were evolving back on the Serengeti, the sound of grass blowing, if we were constantly monitoring that, uh, we would have trouble even getting the gumption up to go hunt. So what broke his area is it recognizes things that are familiar, things that in our, in our past we uh, have seen before. And it literally stores a list of words. Whenever you have a common word like somebody's name, for instance, your father-in-law's name, you're talking to somebody. You don't, your father-in-law may not come to mind very often, uh, but you're talking to someone and you go to mention his name and you've forgotten his name. It's most likely because it has slipped out of Broca and keeps this list of familiar things. And by repeating it, Broca will re-access it and it will slide back into the list of things that are familiar to Broca. So we need to wake up Broca by presenting things to it that are not typical, that are not regular, that are not expected. And in fact, that's exactly what we're looking for. The unexpected, the unbelievable, and in many cases, the just plain wrong side of things. Um, this will, if Broca doesn't find it in its bag of, li its list of the usual, it has no choice but to go over and ask Wernicke for more information about what this word means. This is, I love this little example. This goes back to 2005, but it is absolutely hilarious. Marketing experiments did some tests, and they tested free marketing research. We hold all the secrets to internet marketing by now. These are search ads. They tested this against free marketing research. Lousy marketing ideas don't come to our site. They also tested bulldog info and resources. Site about family dog. Pictures and links here against bulldog info and resources, vaguely useful pet site, affiliate links, and pictures. And as you probably guess, these unexpected ads won in terms of, of click-throughs. Now, we wouldn't want to necessarily go out and do this sort of marketing because the traffic that's going to be coming may not be qualified. But you can start to see why an approach like Betabrand took might work. It's because 
broker doesn't understand this. Why would somebody be marketing lousy ideas? Why would somebody be paying to run ads that say that a site is vaguely useful? Uh, broker has to stop and say, I don't have enough information for this. And at that point, these messages have entered the brain. They've gotten past the first bouncer. Here's another example from the B2B world. Now, I don't know what a GRC solution is. Uh, this is pretty typical in B2B marketing. Uh, they test, they ran two, this was not a split test, but this is two examples for uh, related products. Typical landing page versus this landing page, which shows a kid wearing a cape and leads with ever wanted to be a superhero. Now, this is uh, unusual for a B2B uh, business. This is what I would consider a broker waker. I've got to really pay attention because this is not typical, and certainly I didn't see anything like this on the other four sites I visited while I was doing research on this topic. The more traditional one had a 1.5% conversion rate. The one with the superhero had a 26% conversion rate, and while we wouldn't attribute everything to the fact that this world broke, world broke up, it was certainly a, a component in making this website work better. So how many of you are familiar with the Moravian formula? The one that says 93% of all communication is nonverbal. This has been quoted over and over and over again. And I've heard it less in recent years because I think people realizing that it is um, not, not valuable in certain situations and the truth of the matter that it is total bull. Uh, Moravian was studying how our um, communication, how our brains work when we're communicating in situations where the words don't match the facial expressions. So just like this, this nice smile and lovey, I don't like you, uh, our brain has to stop and say, wait a minute, this doesn't follow, this is unexpected. And in fact, whenever someone's words didn't match their facial expressions, Moravian found out that 93% of the information they would give weight to was the nonverbal, the facial expressions, the, the primarily, as well as the, the body language. So we had the same thing going on on our websites. And it's very much like this. We look at this and we say it's bottles, but clearly this opening is not for bottles. Uh, we are going to very quickly discard the word bottles and give more um, weight to what the opening tells us. It makes good sense. Oh, another example. So. One of the things that we have to deal with is, all right, are we talking about taking chances here? So how far out should we go? What, what are these corner cases? How much risk should we take? Uh, especially in situations like business to business where uh, we've been taught that we need to be um, conservative and safe. And there is a certain expectation of safety when someone is going to be recommending to their boss that they visit your site. But um, you, the the envelope that you have for taking these kinds of chances and for taking risk and waking up broker really lies within the voice of the business. So just because um, you have a business to business side or you're marketing to a more conservative industry, safety doesn't necessarily work for you. Those are things that are familiar and broker is going to very quickly discard them. So within your voice, you want to start taking chances. You want to push the envelope. I'm going to show you an example of an extreme situation. This is Ling's Cars. This is a car leasing company uh, that is headquartered in the UK. Now, any designer that you show this to is going to say, oh my god, this page is totally unaffected. There's no way that this could work. The thing you're not getting here is that there's also singing going on in the background. There's music playing and it starts automatically when you come to this site. So Ling is an extreme example of her voice carrying things forward. The thing you need to know about this is that in 2010 she did over 35 million pounds in car leases. She's incredibly profitable because she doesn't actually purchase the cars. It's all done on behalf of uh, other leasing companies. So uh, all she has to do is market this thing. And is this the way you would go to market? Most of us wouldn't. But when you look at how she does go to market, this is a keynote that she was giving at a digital marketing conference, the future of digital marketing by eConsultancy in 2012. This is the way she went to market. She uses a, a lot of gimmicks. So she, she brought a Russian missile truck as part of her um, the way she goes to market. And she drives around in cars that, that show her and her crazy face and whatever 
crazy things she wants to say. I mean, her site has political commentary on it, things that you would just never expect in a car leasing company. So the truth is that if she just took the kind of the standard way of doing things and put her name on it, this would not work for her. We would expect this actually to underperform the ugly, crazy, confusing uh, web page that we saw before. She is communicating within her voice, and she's communicating with a part of her voice that is pushing it enough to make Broca go, wait a minute, I've got to check this out. Let's talk about Vernica here. So we've, we understand a little bit about Broca. His job is to filter out the familiar. So unfamiliar and unexpected is important. What makes Vernica go, oh, wait a minute, I need to go out and get some information on this? Well, Vernica is looking for relevance, emotion, and storytelling is, for some reason, a good way to wake him up. Vernica's job, as I said, is to take nouns and to associate them with the memories and the images that we have stored around that noun. Uh, so familiarity and emotion and storytelling are the things that help to tee, tee those up. This is a little bit different from what Broca is talking about. So as you can see, we're talking about something unusual to wake up Broca, but our copy has to ha contain elements that are relevant, emotional, and, and presented in story-like structures in order for Vernica to successfully go out and reach into our memories and find relevant, persuasive things. Here's a little example from a test. I got this from the folks at Witch Test 1. Uh, you can see here on the site the control says access valuable business intelligence briefs, demos, webcasts, and white papers. Now, first of all, this is not going to uh, alarm Broca at any, in any way, and uh, this might be ignored by Broca. But if for some reason Broca says, well, until, uh, let's pass this on because this is an important topic, and uh, ask Vernica to you know, assign some memories to this, Vernica is not really going to find a lot. So I haven't had a lot of emotional intelligence briefs. My kids really, I mean, my parents really didn't read any fairy tales about uh, demos and webcasts to me when I was a kid. Um, and there's certainly very little that's emotional about a white paper. They did this test, and instead of that, they put advanced analytics. It started with the five, top five solution beliefs. So this is telling me, number one, oh, so this is something that others have found helpful. Advanced analytics to a guy in a web coat, in a lab coat rather, this is this is exciting. This is relevant. Dashboards and visualization, these are things that we deal with every day. Query reporting analysis. So for the right target audience, these are actually relevant. And Vernica is going to pull from memory times when I've struggled with dashboards, times when I've not been able to really pull the right data together, and maybe SAP has the right solution for me. So this is an example of relevance for the target market. And this, in, this had a 24% increase in leads. Here's something else. This is more on a consumer basis. This is for addiction treatment centers. So uh, if you can imagine someone's coming, they're either struggling with an addiction or they have a loved one that's struggling with an addiction, and it's making the family life unmanageable. It's making their life unmanageable. Coming to a page that says a place of new beginnings. This was tested against addiction, torments, addicts, and their loved ones. Now, I'm going to uh, go ahead and show you. This one had a 184% increase in contacts over the A Place of New Beginnings. And let's take a look at this. This is a story in seven words. I think this is brilliant. This is, you know, I don't write copy like this typically unless I test my way into it. You've got the bad guy, which is the addiction. You've got the protagonist the addicts and their loved ones, you have conflict, the tormenting, addiction is tormenting, and resolution on the story is implied if you continue into the page. So this is a, this is a great example of waking up Broca, but more importantly, providing a story that the visitor is going to relate to. Yes, I am tormented. So given that we've got these two bastards sitting in the brains of everybody who's coming to our site. Uh, what are the sorts of things that we do to use copy to get past these guys and to uh, get wins in the tests that we run for our clients? Number one, Marketing 101, is understanding who is coming. And this is uh, this 
can be and should be a, uh, a very um, exhaustive procedure, but it's often difficult on the web because we don't have the data that we're looking for. It's difficult to tease it out. So we always look for ways to simplify who's coming and start to segment people based on their tendencies. And uh, the Eisenberg brothers, Brian and Jeffrey Eisenberg, wrote a, a book called Waiting for Your Cat to Bark, which has really been a touchstone for our practice uh, since it came out in uh, 2005 or 2006. Uh, you can still find it on Amazon, but I think you can find a PDF now out in the wild. They may have released it to the public domain. But they gave us a nice, uh, simple way of targeting our copy based on whether the reader is going to be making decisions emotionally or logically, and if they're going to be making decisions uh, quickly or deliberately. And they create four kinds of people. Number one is the competitive, who are going to make decisions logically, but they're going to make decisions quickly. Their primary thing is that they're looking for what's in it for me. These are the people that set goals and, and set the, the, the process in place to achieve those goals, and they get a big, uh, big dopamine squirt in their brain whenever they achieve a goal. Uh, they like to, to find brands, and premium brands, and these brands as a guidance for how they can be better. Uh, competitives, you're going to be not messing around, you're going to be presenting what's in it for them early on, and once they see that there's something in it for them, they become a little bit more methodical and a little bit more deliberate. The methodicals, on the other hand, are going to be logical and deliberate. And these guys, when you write for these guys, you're really going to be putting all of the proof points in. You're going to be explaining why your offer is better. You're going to be explaining how you dif you're differentiated. You're going to have to give them details on your processes. Uh, these guys are not going to take action until they feel like they know all the answers. They won't even pick up the phone and call until they already know the answers to the questions they're going to be asking. The spontaneous guys, these are the guys that you, you want to put the shiny objects on the page for. They are scanners of the page, if you're lucky. And that's only if they see something typically at the top of the page above the fold that gives them reason to continue staying on the page. Um, they are looking for reasons to take action. So uh, a very uh, powerful call to action is going to work for these guys, uh, but you're not going to have very long to deal with them. And then the humanists, they're primarily interested in who they're dealing with. They're going to make decisions emotionally and very deliberately. And so you're going to write copy for these guys. If you feel like you have, for instance, people coming in who are looking to donate to a nonprofit, they may be coming in more of a, a humanist mode. They want to make sure that they're donating to people that really do care, not a corporation. They want to know something about the people that will be receiving the aid of their donation. So writing copy for them, you're going to want to talk about who you are, you're going to provide information on your employees, you're going to tell stories about how you've helped people and, and really help them get an idea of, of how they can build a relationship with you. So as a guide, if you can just stop and think, well, how are people coming to this? Um, you're not really segmenting your audience because a methodical person who likes to have all the information can come in a very spontaneous mode. For instance, if they're looking for a plumber, and there's a leak under their sink, and we're going to talk about that. So images are a part of copy, and a lot of times when we talk about copy, copywriting, we really are talking, uh, we think we're talking about just the words, the words, the punctuation, the fonts, and the colors that we're using for those, but images are such a powerful way to communicate part of our value proposition, and too often we punt on this. So I'm going to offer for you what's called the caption test. If you go look at your website and look at some of the page, some of the images that are on there, if you don't have a caption for them, you should, because captions get read, and it's a great place to expand on or repeat your call to action is in the caption under an image. But if you can't write a, a logical caption for that image, it's probably what we call business porn. That means that it's probably a stock photo, a filler image, something the designer dropped in there because he felt oh, an image would look good here. It'll help balance the text and everything else on the page. But the image really needs to help advance your value proposition on any persuasive page. Uh, so let's take a look. Shaking hands. We see this all over the place, especially in business to business. If I was to write a caption for this, we all know what we're talking about. We want to shake your hand so that you can start sending us checks. That's the way people are acknowledging that. And they're going to look at this. So this is two white men. Is, there, uh, is, is that 
what we're dealing with? Is a humanist going to infer from this that that's the sort of relationship that we're building? How about this? The, uh, the graph that has no labels, no units, and really no meaning. The caption for this, I don't know. We don't know what we're measuring, but it looks pretty damn good. Uh, you would not put this caption on your site, so don't put the image that, pro that accompanies it on your site either. And then, of course, the pretty people smiling for the camera. Uh, I don't know what this means other than uh, if you work with us, you might get laid. Uh, you might get to work with pretty people. You might feel young. This is pandering and manipulative, and we know the difference between a valid image and a stock photo. Don't use these. This person doesn't work here, but we'll already have you on the phone before you realize it. That's right. We know a stock photo when we see it, and that's the way we're going to interpret these images. And then there's kind of the pandering thing. So um, the, 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 the folks that will use images, stock images, just to show that they are not racist. And that's what it communicates. We aren't racist or sexist. Uh, we really aren't sure we had to point that out. This is the caption I would write for these. And most importantly is show the damned offer. So this is the probably the most important job of the uh, the image is showing the offer. If you have no other recourse to show what you're offering. Now this can be a little bit difficult when you're providing something that's a digital delivery or you're providing a service. The, the, the page is persuading them to take advantage of a service. But think about it. So I did this for uh, one of the people that was in my landing page critique class. Uh, they had this 150-page PDF that was a really helpful book for safety-related control systems on the machinery for the manufacturers that they sold to. 150-page uh, book. So what I did is I actually dropped this in PowerPoint, which is one of my favorite editors did a few transformations, and then made sure that the thickness communicated that this was a real value. And you can do the same, too. If you have an eight-page report, there's an advantage to a busy executive seeing that it is not a deep uh, a book that they have to read, but that it's thin and, and quick to read. So use this on your if you've got PDF downloads, because this physical book, what does it do? It helps me imagine on the Visual Spatial Sketch Pad holding it using it, reading it, even though I know logically that I am not going to get a physical book through this offer. Here's a couple of others. So there's a, a, a program called Buckshot 3D, or now it's called just Buckshot, that I use to render things like uh, uh, eBooks. We have an eBook offering Beat the Rising Cost of SEO. And um, on our uh, whimsical site that we use to play with called buystuff.com, you can actually go on and buy one of our posters um, that has the 20 uh, unexpected formulas of the conversion scientist on it. And we were able to render these quite easily uh, using Buckshot 3. So there's no excuse uh, not to show the product if there's something physical or even something digital. The other thing you want to do is build some trust. So um, as you're going through the process, uh, you can use images of uh, your customers to build trust. Some of these guys you've heard of, some of them you haven't. Um, but nonetheless, you, I, we are borrowing trust. Many of you have pets have heard of one of the younger pet meds. Uh, those of you who love to dance and stay fit while you do it have probably heard of Zumba Fitness. Um, if you're not in Texas, you probably haven't heard of TXU Energy, but this is communicating that these folks have worked with us and with whatever we're offering, and uh, you you can trust us because they let us put their logo on. Um, it's a little bit less over the head in terms of the actual psychology at work here, but nonetheless, you are borrowing trust. So use images to borrow trust. And then trust seals. Um, you know, every every audience is really different on this on this topic. So this is one study. I would not take this as the uh, uh, as the truth that tested which trust seals seem to work better from a conversion standpoint. Uh, one of our customers actually created their own badge just to have it sitting on the site. This is if they can live up to this, then I suspect it's okay. But this feels a little. Um, nefarious. And what are your risk reversals? 
So these badges and stars are familiar. There's a, a trade-off here between we see them so much that they've lost. Broca's put them in store and uh, is going to ignore them. But this is another way of using images on the site to communicate that you do offer a risk reversal, a guarantee, a warranty uh, feedback. So the bottom line here is that you should spend as much time on the images as you spend on the words. Uh, and you can get pretty creative. Here's a little local business here in Austin. Um, this company sells heat reflecting paint. So it's paint with little glass um, uh, beads in it. And when you paint it on the outside or the inside of your roof, the glass beads reflect heat. So this was a great example. I think this is the niece of the owner had her climb up on a roof that they, they painted in the middle of a hot Texas summer. It was 102 degrees and carried one of these poolside temperature thermometers um, with her. And in this one uh, unprofessionally taken, this was taken with a, a phone or a one-shot camera, um, communicates the value of the product amazingly well. And especially if you're familiar with the Texas summers, you do not climb on a hot tin roof when it's 102 degrees outside. You just don't. So this is a great example of, uh, of using images to communicate a value proposition. Take the time to think about what could we present as an image that would accompany the copy. I was speaking with uh, a copywriter recently. She said, you know, I became a great copywriter, a really great copywriter, when I learned how to use Illustrator. And that empowered her to combine both her words and images to make the value proposition ring, to get it past Broca, and have Vernica say, oh, I understand pictures. The other thing we want to do is keep promises. So uh, whenever we look for what we want our headlines to say in particular, most important thing we can do is keep the promises. There's bad ways to wake up Broca, and one of the bad ways is to promise something, have Broca come to a web page, and then not see what they expected. Uh, this is going to paint something very negative on the visual spatial sketch pad about your brand. We were talking about plumbers, the emergency plumber. Uh, if I've got a leak under my sink and it's ruining my new wood floors, I am looking for a very particular kind of experience. And if you do this, you'll go and you'll find that there are plumbing businesses that want your emergency business. They've got trucks all over the city and they want to keep them busy. So the emergency services is a great way for them to save money. Uh, however, when you click on these, you find out that not all of them are responding to that. So Thunderbird Plumbing, I don't know who these guys are. Uh, are they, you know, uh, at a bar somewhere? Are they really going to be able to get to my house fast enough to turn the water off and save my wood floors? There's nothing on this page that indicates that, uh, except that the phone number is there in red. Most likely, though, I'm going to go back to the search results page, and I'm going to look for something else. And here we go, AAA Auger. Look at this. No extra charge on weekends, holidays, or nights. Oh, so if this is happening at 10 at night, I've got a place to go. 24-hour emergency plumbing, and the phone number is there in red. I feel uh, really, really good about this, and I'm going to give these guys a call. Here's another example from the world of Zumba, the new Wonderland collection. Now, I saw this ad as I was surfing around the web, and uh, I thought I would look awesome in this outfit. Look at that. That's, you know, it's just... It's slimming, and I think that the pattern kind of uh, trims off some of the extra weight that I might be carrying. So I'm going to click through, and I'm going to look for the Wonderland collection. The page they brought me to on this was this. Now, I don't see that awesome outfit. In fact, the model has changed as well. And I don't see any mention of the new, collect the new collection. Uh, it doesn't say Wonderland anywhere. Uh, so I type it in the search box, which you can see there on the screen. I typed in Wonderland. The search results returned zero. So this is a significantly broken promise. The only thing that this does well, and something you should consider when you're using visual calls to action and visual ads, is keeping the colors the same. Um, the visitor's on a scent, so as you're producing pages that have persuasive copy and imagery on them, uh, keeping something standard like the model or the design, the colors that are used in the design, will help you um, get through, keep people going. 
so you don't get this bad, broke, wake up experience of what this doesn't make sense, and it makes so little sense that I'm just going to go away. Some of the other things that we like to do is getting is taking the geographical uh, issue into account. Uh, this is an example of an Australian experience gifting site. So you can go here and you can buy someone the ability to jump out of an airplane, which doesn't make sense. You can buy a gift for them for uh, driving a race car or a motorcycle. They can go hang gliding. They can go wine tasting. Um, lots of things that you could imagine doing that are experience gifts. These guys wanted to test and, and did some research and said, well, maybe the first question is, is the gift going to happen close to me? So if you're on one side of Australia, you don't want to be searching for gifts that you have to fly or drive across the continent in order to take advantage of. And they were right about this. So just by starting with where are you, they were able to increase inquiries by 27.9% on these pages. So think about where your visitor is. This is a relevance thing. So this is Vernica is understanding that if you have, if I see, for instance, the state of uh, the, the Maple Leaf from Canada or the, the state of Michigan, these become things that Vernica says, oh, this is home. And I begin to associate these memories in my mind with um, home and all the things that it means. I mean, I'm a Texan, so when we see this, there are certain things triggered in our minds that of, of pride and hard work and long drives just to get to your neighbor's house, um, cows, cowboys, and tumbleweeds, whatever comes to mind, you know that you're using location to bring these up, and that's one of the things Vernick is looking for. So I want to talk a little bit, too, about um, presenting things as, as, as is expected. So assuming that we're able to wake up Broca with uh, an introduction or a pre presentation or value proposition that is unexpected, wh what can we do to connect Vernica to um, the things that it's expecting to find? There are two broad classes of these kind of visitors, transactionals and relationals. So a transactional visitor, their biggest fear in life is spending $1 too much. They will do everything they can to save that dollar. They're looking for coupons. They're going to visit 10 sites and four physical stores looking for the best price on those jeans or on that hammock that they want to buy. They get a dopamine squirt when they save money. And they actually will convert higher if you give them obstacles like promotion codes and things. Uh, they want to be the expert in the, in the situation, and they see shopping as a part of the fun. The relational, on the other hand, their biggest fear is choosing the wrong thing. So they are looking for an expert to help them. They see shopping as part of the expense. So the longer it takes for them to find the right thing, the more expensive the thing seems to them for everybody. Uh, they are not going to be looking necessarily for the best price because they will pay a premium for great advice. So it, when you're on your side and you're thinking about what do we need to bring to our copy in order to appeal to one or the other, or should, we should do a test to find out which of those we're getting the most of, these are the sorts of things that you'll want to look for. Here's a control for an ad that says save $100 on 12 world-class reds. Now, given my description of transactional and relational, since we're, be, we're leading with the savings, uh, what do you think this copy is for? This copy is probably more of a transactional, or it would appeal to more of a transactional buyer. It leads with the saving. The $69.99 is there. We see an image of the, uh, the gift card to reinforce that. This, again, is allowing us to imagine holding the discount, and this is a good use of image, in my opinion. Versus this one. We're going to swap out this copy, and we're saying, enjoy 12 world-class reds. So what this is saying is that this company, Lothwaite's Wine, is going to pick world-class reds for me. They are being the expert. So that if I take advantage of this, I'm not going to be embarrassed by my um, visitors um, and, and have crappy reds. All the offers are still there. All the $100 voucher and everything is still there. It just leads very differently. And for this audience, it's more of a relational audience. So the winner here was the, uh, the relational message. We did a, a couple of ads for... Uh, a, a client, and the highest performing ads were 20% off and $100 off. These are on high-end window treatments, shades that will actually raise and lower automatically that can be handled controlled remote, by remote control uh, from your iPad and things like that. So we thought it was the, 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 the 
value proposition on their landing pages was, uh, we'll send somebody to your house and they'll work with you, a very relational approach. So we said maybe we should have more transactional copy. So their, uh, their control, they really focused on unbelievable savings and free installation. So it's focusing on take the stress out of shopping for large window fashions. It's more of a relational. We thought we could turn this up and make it even more transactional. And so we said in-home manufacturer discounts is how we led from these. Uh, certified designers can offer you $100 off each unit you purchase. So we're definitely leading with more of a transactional um, situation. And we talked about combining discounts. We had a little bit of limited time. The net upshot of this was that we made the landing page much more transactional. And in the, in the space, in the scope of the best performing ads, we were able to get a 40% increase in leads generated. These are our booked um, uh, visits from a designer to come in and help choose your window shades. So this is another powerful way that we can really provide relevance. If I'm a transactional buyer, Vernick is going to be looking for savings. That's just the way he's going to be built. If it's a relational driver, a re relational visitor, Vernick is going to be looking for more of the help me um, be an expert, uh, help me not make a bad decision. Emotion and surprise. So. Um, in order to really get the best copy that we're, we're, looking, we're looking for, uh, it's a two-step process. Number one, hire a great copywriter and trust them, and then measure them. So I've uh, got my Malcolm Gladwell talks about the 10,000 hours you need to become an outlier, to become the best at what you do, to become excellent at something, whether you're playing the trombone or writing. And I've definitely got my 10,000 hours is on writing. And yet still, I don't have the skill set to write persuasive copy that someone who has been through the ringer and tested over and over again does. So even us, we prefer to hire people uh, who write copy. And it's hard to do. Many people will uh, have a great portfolio, but when you come and measure them, they're not used to being measured. So picking, uh, picking a great copywriter, number one, is understanding their uncovery process. So they should speak to your sales team, your customer service guys. They should read your customer reviews, your uh, ratings and reviews, your live chat transcripts, and they should be visiting forums and groups and social media in your uh, industry to really get a great idea of what's, what, what they're going to be writing about. They should have a tested portfolio. So they should have pages where they've actually tried to beat someone's uh, control. These guys are really difficult to find. If you can find someone who has been through this process, they're going to be a, a dream to work with. They have to know a little bit about design and user experience. So as I said, if you can find a designer that also gets the image side of things, uh, it's awesome. If they, they can use something as simple as this. This is an uh, eye tracking uh, scan of an ad. The baby looking at us, we just want to look at the baby. We are our limbic lizard brain is wired to look at babies because they're so cute. This copywriter may know that all we have to do is have the baby look at our offer and look how much more attention is going on the offer that builds that value proposition. So copywriters that know some of this stuff, they shouldn't be afraid of analytics. If you're talking with them about bounce rates, if you're talking with them about abandonment rates, they shouldn't be confused about that. Um, they should understand how they would change their copy given the, the kind of uh, analytics data that you're giving back to them. And they've got to be bottom line oriented. So they need to be talking about how we are increasing your sales or how we're increasing the number of leads or how we're increasing the number of phone calls you're getting from these pages. Um, anybody who's not really focused on that uh, may not be qualified to write your persuasive copy. So let's do a real quick um, uh, test. What I've taught you about Broca is that we need to wake up Broca, but we also need to have relevant, emotional, uh, and story-oriented things for Vernica, right? We've talked about the importance of words. We've talked about the importance of images. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you a test. I'm going to let you take a moment. This is not going to be a poll, but take a moment and think about which of these you think, based on what I've taught you, which of these you think would uh, outperform the others. This is for a treatment center. This is a headline on a landing page for a treatment center, and our goal is to get them to call. For these clients, and for many clients, a phone call is worth 10 times the, uh, the, the value of a form fill. So we can help call, speak with a compassionate rehab specialist, 
Yeah, you know, and, and as you're thinking about these, uh, go ahead and also enter your questions. We're going to be wrapping up here very quickly, uh, and just want to make sure we have time for some questions. So, Brian, okay. if you could wrap up after this, that'd be great. Thank you. I will, absolutely. Which of these do you think will work? Speak with a compassionate rehab specialist? Call. Ready to start healing? Call. And ready to stop lying? If so, we can help. Call. Well, the first was the control. How many of you picked B? That was a 32% increase in phone calls. This is huge for this client. How many of you picked C, ready to start healing? That caused an 18% drop. And ready to stop lying. This is a broke awaker if I ever saw one. This had a 43% increase. And if you can imagine this, not only waking up broken, but this is something that is, a, is, is there in addiction, in addiction situations where um, loved ones are de denying to themselves and addicts are lying about things. This has both the broke awaking and the storytelling uh, in it. So hopefully we've got enough to, to say that you guys are confident enough to get past the bouncers in the brain. Um, and I think this is a great time uh, for us to go ahead and take some, some calls. Uh, we have a conversion upside calculator. If you want to, um, if you want to understand uh, what your upside is, what small changes in your conversion rate will do for your bottom line, this is the calculator that, that does that for you and tells you where you are in terms of being ready for conversion optimization. Um, taking calls, I meant taking some questions. Tim, do we have questions? Tim, are you there? We can't hear you. You might be muted. Tim, muted? That's an unusual occurrence. <laughs> Yes, indeed, I was muted. I, I just want to tell everyone about our next upcoming webinar. Thank you so much, Brian. Our, our next month, at the end of February, we'll be talking about Google Analytics tricks for huge CRO advantage. We all know we should be doing analytics, but it's kind of like going to a dentist. No one wants to do it. Well, David Booth from Cardinal Path is going to spill the beans about uh, how to actually make money off of it and, and use it for practical CRO. So come to sitetuners.com and just uh, register for, for our next webinar as well. All right, uh, and also just wanted to let you know that if any of you are interested in a free 15-minute conversion mini-review, uh, we would uh, love to conduct one for you. There's some eligibility there. You have to do this by February 6th. Sign up, that is. You don't have to actually do the review. So go to bit.ly slash CRO review and sign up there. We're only going to do the first three from today's webinar. Okay, so go there, bit.ly.com bit.ly slash CRO review. And finally, I know, Brian, you've spoken at Conversion Conference before, and uh, your COO, Joel Harvey, has also spoken there in the past and is going to be speaking at our big Las Vegas mega show. This is now yeah. a standalone show. Uh, we're only having one show a year in the U.S. now, in addition to our London and Berlin shows in the fall. Um, we have some great keynotes. Uh, you're if four tracks now. You're going to drink from the fire hose. Uh, for fans of Brian and Joel, uh, use the promo code JOEL100 uh, to buy this Friday for an additional $100 off. Um, so let's take a couple of questions here. Uh, we had some folks uh, ask about this. Uh, so let me, let me just see if I can find one out here. Um, one of the questions from Tony was, why do designers hate copy? I think that's it's just the psychology of that. Why do designers hate copy? How, I don't know that uh, I don't know that they hate copy. I, you know, the thing is that designers were generally taught. Um, there's a lot of Madison Avenue still around the industry. Um, uh, that sounds counter though, because copy has always been so important in direct mail and things like that. I think maybe that the the problem designers have is that the beautiful things often don't win. That's the WTF result. Uh, right. So many times ugly will win over the beautifully crafted design. Say, it doesn't have to be ugly, but I would say plain, simple, unadorned. You know, so I think you know, part of the answer is that they'd rather decorate than 
uh, think about the business purpose of the site. Is that a fair generalization? Uh, for the most yeah. part, I've met some great visual designers that are very focused on conversion, but they're rare. Yeah, I think so. The, the designers that when you say we've got this data about who we're, we're targeting, marketing to and these are the things that have worked, the ones that get excited about that, having some mm -hmm. guidelines and a little bit of a fence around their design, those are the guys I would bet on rather than they're like, oh, but I know how to do this. We've done this right. millions of times. Um, and, I, and I think we have one more question that we'll, we'll be able to get to, and that is uh, well, somebody is asking, you were talking about the different types of uh, you know, personality types, if you will, or cognitive styles. I have a whole section in my landing page optimization book about different frameworks for that. Uh, mm -hmm. I like Brian and Jeffries as well. Uh, but basically the question is, what if you have a mix of the different groups? I know that can be a long answer, so what's the short version? What if you have logical and meth methodical and emotional people? Yeah, the, uh, the kind of the rule of thumb we use is for, for your spontaneous and your, your competitors, the quick decision makers, you need, their, you need to get their uh, attention above the fold. Um, for the more deliberate visitors, the methodicals and the relationals, they have, uh, seem to have more of a tendency to scroll to find out more because they're infer inf interested in more information. So um, put, the, uh, put the shiny objects and the what's in it for me above the fold and put the more detailed information above the fold. And that, that gives you kind of a, a basic framework for that. Okay, so the fact is, unless you have a very skewed population, like you know, if you're if you have a site aimed at 15-year-old boys for bungee jumping or something like that, then you know you have mostly those thrill-seeking types. But everybody, most of us have a mix of them. So basically, you have to put little markers or trailheads for all of the different cognitive styles. You can't just uh, leave one off. That's the point. Right? And your your promise in your ad or your link or your email. Is going to kind of define that for you. So if it's a, it's a, if it's a report, you know you're going to be getting more deliberate visitors. If it's a, um, you know, a tchotchke to just to get their uh, email address, you know you're going to get more of these spontaneous visitors, and you can design your copy accordingly. All right. Well, very good, Brian. I know we could uh, you know, spend another hour or two uh, going into this in more detail. We really appreciate you being on the show. I'm and glad uh, to be here. Our webinar attendees, you know, sign up for David Booth's next webinar on the Site Tuner site, and uh, hopefully we'll see you at our big mega show in Las Vegas, uh, May 12th through 14th. And uh, thanks again, loyal listeners. We'll see you on the flip side.